during the last few days, we've been dealing with the subtle Amada and Abhamada in pairs, and we came to the pair of Anatitana and Atitana. As for the Anatitana, one is not established in the performance of good deeds, kusala. And even if one is established, such an establishment is not durable or strong enough. Whatever you do, whatever undertaking you do, you have to stand firmly on that side so that you become established in it. When once you are able to become established in your undertaking, in this case, the performance of good deeds, you are said to be heedful in a subtle way, a subtle form of abhamada. At this point, uh, yesterday, Sarah promised to talk about the four things which lead to this uh, establishment, from establishment. So today we shall deal with this subject, that is, these four things, both from the theoretical and practical aspects. If our mind is not controlled with mindfulness, then it is more likely that we will commit unskillful deeds, akusalas, more than kusala, skillful deeds. Therefore, firm establishment is very essential. And there are these causes for good deeds, that is, adetana. Uh, there are these four things as given in the commentaries, which will be helpful for the yogis. And uh, if one is not established, in the performance of good deeds, then one is bound to be shaken or affected by these unwholesome deeds. Therefore, it is necessary to be able to observe the rules. Now, mind is peculiar in that when one is confronted with desirable object, one is bound to become attached greed will arise, one will wish to possess it, that is greed, loba, that is quite sure. And as a corollary, when it comes to undesirable object, there will be dissatisfaction and ill will, disappointment and so on, which is dosa in essence. If one is not able to see the realities that is the natural characteristics, or even if one sees, if it's not effective, about the obvious object noted, then one is bound to be deluded, uh, will, not, will not possess clear mind, will feel dim, will not see things clearly, that is moha, delusion, which is associated with any unskillful states or consciousness. Sometimes it is associated with greed, at other times with anger or ill will. Sometimes without being attached or associated with greed or hatred, it can also arise on its own so that one becomes deluded. So if one is overwhelmed by one of these unwholesome roots, great hatred, delusion, then one is bound to commit unskillful deeds. Like traveling through a thorny area. You might tread on a thorn and be pierced with a thorn. Or when you are driving in uh, unusually heavy traffic, it is more likely that you land into accidents. Especially if you are not on the right track, or if you are not obeying the rules such as the traffic rules, or driving over speed, beyond the speed limit, not obeying the traffic lights, then you are bound to land into accidents harming yourself, not only harming yourself, but harming others. 
So only when you perform with great care will be will you be free from accidents and reach the desired destination. Now one's mind. If one practices self control, then one can become firmly established and walking along the Dhamma path one is bound to reach the land of peace. As for as to the first point, try to put a limit on your mind that whatever object you may see or experience, I will only be able to possess pure mind, skillful mind, kusala deed. In this way one should have a predetermination beforehand that only kusala should arise yeah, for whichever object I may come across. So even if one comes into contact with desirable object, loba, now when you say loba, this is, uh, we just uh, put it in the forefront as a heading, uh, also it, is, it also applies to other unskillful states of mind. So even if one comes into contact with a desirable object, there cannot arise any desire or greed if one has put a limit on one's mind beforehand. Instead, only pure mind will arise. One's mind will remain pure. And the same thing applies to other unwholesome states of mind, such as hatred, dissatisfaction, dosa, even if the object can arouse anger or ill will, instead of anger or ill will, one has put a limit on one's mind or one has predetermined, predetermined that one will only view it or see it with a pure mind in a skillful way, in a sort of unskillful way. And when it comes to objects which can arouse delusion, moha, since you are noting every arising and seeing the nature of the objects, beginning with mind and body and the universal characteristics and so on, you are knowing the nature of the mind. You are cultivating knowledge. Since you are knowing, there will be no unknowing. There will be no delusion, lack of clarity. So, because your, your mind is, your knowledge is clear cut, you know the object in a clear cut manner. Your knowledge is very clear as regards the object. So, there cannot be any delusion. Whatever object you come into contact, you are determined that there will be only kusala mind arising instead of akusala mind. In this way one is limiting one's mind and such is the patisakanabala, reflective power of reflective knowledge. And if one is uh, limiting one's mind with mindfulness practice, that uh, one will only cause pure mind as regards objects arising through the sixth sense doors, guarding your mind with vigilant mindfulness of every arising, every seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, he, uh, smelling, thinking, rising, falling, lifting, moving and placing. You are determined that you will only let pure mind to arise instead of impure mind impurities. So there won't be any akusala, instead there will be only kusala, there will be purity. And also as regards undesirable object, whatever it is, you are determined that you practice patience and tolerance as regards whatever it is, maybe, maybe food, shelter, clothing, 
or anything, any experience. You are beaten and you have determined that you will only let skillful, pure mind arise instead of impure, unskillful mind. So in this way you are limiting, putting a limit, putting a determination on your mind and uh, as regards thought, speech and acts, this such as Padisanka and Abala, power of reflection. And when it comes to practical experience, through your experiential knowledge, uh, as, as you are guarding your mind with vigilant mindfulness of every rising, then there will be no kilisas rising, as the saying goes. Unmindfulness allows kilisas. Mindfulness repels them. So, noting every arising object, you are limiting your mind with this uh, bhavana so as to allow only skillful mind, pure mind, to rise in you. As for those who are prone to thoughts, imaginations, especially uh, they have been used to such things, then they can be drifted along the thoughts and imaginations. Just like Shiva said yesterday when one yogi saw him, uh, he said that there was some dem- demon in me, the demon in him. So, if one is not predetermined, in fact, uh, one should understand that uh, thinking is a great disturbance, in, especially in the, in the practice of Sati Bhattana. Seeing the disadvantages of such things, such thoughts, one should be able to note uh, carefully so that one will be able to note and know things which, are, which should be noted and known. Understanding this, one should cherish one's own empirical knowledge. Rather than this Pratisangana Bala, one should indulge or one should take up, undertake this Bhavana Bala, that, that practice of meditation, seeing, noting things, uh, to cultivate one's mind and insight, which is more valuable. So if one should give priority to more valuable, more worthy practice or discipline, and by doing so, one should be determined in putting a limit to one's mind that I will only let the bhavana mind arise to know true nature of things. So in this way, when you are practicing this lofty discipline of wholesomeness, instead of letting your mind be drifted along or distracted towards other objects and not giving priority to other objects, one should be able to concentrate on one's main object of attention with the bhavana uh, pala. Let the kusala mind arise with the practice of meditation. Yogi who is uh, not encouraging such destructive thoughts and uh, if one is able to limit one's mind or determine with a uh, determination to let the bhavana mind arise, then one is bound to become accomplished with one's objective. If one is not longing for thoughts, thinking, understanding this, that uh, thinking is a great disturbance to the bhavana bala or meditation, one will not anticipate or expect such things to come in one's mind. That means not allowing one's mind to be drifted along the fragmentary, destructive thoughts. So, instead, if one is able to sustain one's mindfulness on the object of arising, on the arising object, then one will be able to cultivate this bhavana mind every second, every moment of the practice, and one is bound to progress along this path and be able to cultivate knowledge. 
until one reaches the maturity of the practice. Even if one is confronted with thoughts unavoidably, if one is one will if one does not give priority or one does not give way to such destructive thoughts, thinking, knowing that uh, these thoughts are destructive, their disturbances, they can weaken this bhavana mind, bhavana bala. As soon as one is determined in this way, be determined in this way, and put a limit on one's mind, then one will be able to uh, stop this momentum easily. Then, this, as soon as one, uh, as soon as thoughts start to invade your mind, because you are predetermined, this process will be cut off. This current, this uh, process of thoughts uh, running like a current will be cut off at once because you have already predetermined. Otherwise, if you are drifting along this current of thoughts, you will not be knowing that even, you will not, you, will, you won't be even uh, aware of your distraction until the story finishes. Oh, I have been thinking. And you are too late. Neither will be able to note and know the arisen, arising object, nor will you be able to know that you are actually thinking. Uh, only realizing only at the end of the story. So, rather than uh, getting drifted in thoughts, one should be able to note the thought at once, effectively. Otherwise, one will be going through what is known as vicious cycle, thinking, thinking, and thinking again, and so on. There will be no end. Thinking till one dies. <laughs> if one is uh, determined to note respectfully, carefully, effectively, if one is in this position, then from the beginning of the practice, one will be able to note energetically, precisely, as regards the main object, in this case rising and falling, so as not to miss it, because one is all, already uh, has this in one's heart or head, whatever you think your mind is. So since the beginning of the practice, you are doing it respectfully, carefully. And Practically, you are noting. Sometimes, uh, you are noting. Uh, your noting is not so uh, very short, not so long, not many. And there are more of distraction than mindfulness. But you are aware of your distraction. You are aware of your wandering mind. So, in the beginning of the practice, your mind is going out running away from you, often and often. Whenever it runs away, you note it. It runs away again, you note it. Because you are determined to stay with the main object and no other, none other, then not only do you know the main object, not only do you note and know the nature of the main object, but also note and know your destructive thoughts. So, honestly, you are noting rising and falling. And not only do you not know rising and falling, you are also knowing the nature of your mind, that your mind is running away. So when you are reporting to your meditation teacher in the interviews, you will report in a very honest way, sincerely, that, oh, I try to note the rising and falling, the main object, but my mind is going away, going out many times. So I have to note them. I have to, I'm busy noting my wandering mind. So if one is able to do this, this is of course in the beginning of the practice, not in the middle of the end of the practice, retreat. 
In the beginning of the retreat for a beginning yogi, mind always goes up. That's why you call it yogi mind. Yogi mind is such. There's nothing strange about it. So if you report to the meditation teacher like this, as it is, then you are said to be sincere, or you are said to be doing, practicing strictly in accordance with the teacher's instructions and guidance. Such a sincere yogi is bound to cultivate concentration and knowledge in a very short time because of his or her sincerity. If one is predetermined in this way and put a limit on one's mind that I will only stay with the object. So when it comes to these objects or sometimes you are indulging in thoughts whenever the, that there is this uh, occasion for thoughts. Uh, you know that they, they are time consuming. They are not pure, they are not uh, impure. So you know that you, are, you will not be allowing these destructive thoughts to arise. Instead, you will stay, you, you will always stay with the main object of attention. Yoyo Kama Soloshi Kudu Ne Saluda Janshi Me Teke Kulu Atung Nere Kama Yoma Sekudu Ne Janshi Muri Me Pshisi Me Ne Matti Ji Pshisi Me Sule If one is determined in ordinary times that one will only give way to wholesome thoughts and uh, when one is taking up this practice one will only uh, allow pure mind to arise by noting every arising object. Then, if one is determined in this way, both in both for ordinary activities and uh, in the practice of uh, Satipatthana, mostly one's uh, mind will be inclined towards wholesomeness or purity. For instance, at ordinary, ti- at ordinary times, one comes, one is uh, uh, there's an occasion to do some dana offering, good deed of a merit, merit uh, dana merit. Then, if you have something to also offer, to make an offering, to do merit, then the, you will have this kusala mind, because you are predetermined, that you will allow only skillful deeds to rise. So, you will be able to offer uh, the, the gift of the things as Dana Kusa. That is for ordinary times, ordinary, ordinary moments. But when it comes to the practice, you don't need to uh, have thoughts about this. There's no time for thoughts because you are predetermined to note the arising object as soon as it arises without thinking, then you'll be able to do it precisely and energetically and uh, in a very concise and determined manner. Even if in ordinary times that uh, one comes into contact with undesirable object, objects that can arouse anger or dissatisfaction, you are only determined that uh, I will practice patience or tolerance. Uh, I will be the one who practice tolerance. I will be tolerant towards others instead of others being tolerant towards me. So in this way, if you are predetermined, you will be able to practice patience because you are giving priority to beauty, kusala deeds. So even if you are confront, if you're confronted with undesirable things, uh, only kusala mind will arise. So such is how you are able to determine your mind uh, and uh, this is the first point about the establishment to be brought, to be firmly established. So this is now the time you need to put a limit to one's mind that you'll only confine yourself to the practice of mindfulness of every arising. Otherwise it'll be time consuming, wastage of time. There'll be no end to it. If there's no sati, 
there cannot be any samadhi or penya, then it will not be worthwhile coming here uh, to practice meditation. So to be worthwhile coming here and uh, practicing and uh, uh, practice and retreat, yogis, knowing that thoughts are disturbing or disturbances, one should put a limit on one's mind that I will only stay with heavy rising object. The second aspect is changing your mind or transformation, let's say, so that one's will not be one will, one's mind will not go towards unskillful things, not allowing akusana deeds to rise and set only pure mind to rise. One should change in such a way, change from bad to good. That is the essence. So when the text is given, if one is not uh, noting every rising object, that is, uh, one is not skilled in mindfulness, then more there will be more akusala and duty arising in one stream of consciousness, such as these akusala and skillful deeds uh, headed by greed, hatred or delusion. As the saying goes, and mindfulness allows kilesas and mindfulness repels them. In this way, if you practice, uh, if you are not able to aim correctly, taking an aim correctly, rightly, even if you, t- if you aim, your aiming is not concurrent, and also your energy is low, if your energy is low, you will be overshooting your object. So, the mind can be drifted along, drifted towards unskillful things, such as great hatred and so on. Then, this will flow on, this will flow as like a current without end. So, in accordance, in the spirit of Satipatthana, you got to activate your mindfulness of every arising. If one, if the, the, all the unwholesome thoughts are arising and not be able to cut off, but since your mind is determined to change your mind from akusala to kusala, let kusala arise instead of akusala, then you can transform, you can change your mind from this impurity towards purity. You can do this at ordinary times and also in the course of the practice as a yogi. When these akusala thoughts are arising, impure thoughts are arising in you, and even if you know them, they are not going away, they are not leaving you, they are with you all the time, then try to pull your mind towards noting the main object of arising, then your mindfulness will continue. So in this way you can change your mind from bad to good. Now in the text are given many methods of changing your mind, of change, but if we deal with this subject, is it will, uh, there are too many things to talk about and it may be time consuming. So, when objects arise, if impure, impure mind arises, impure thoughts arises, akusa thoughts arises, like a current without end, then uh, make a habit. If it's a bad habit, you've got to change it. You cannot keep it like this all the time. Bad habits have to be changed. Otherwise, they will not become good. So improve these bad habits, change these bad habits to become good ones. In this way, you have to change it. So, if in this way one can, one can practice this uh, second method. Now we go on to the third method. That is, make a practice of skillfulness. Train your mind 
to become skillful. Train your mind, cultivate your physical, verbal, mental behavior so that they become blameless, pure, cultivated, and affable, pleasant, graceful. So in this way, you train your mind. You make it a practice to train your mind so that your training will continue, previous training will continue with succeeding training. Like uh, the flow boats, look at these flow boats uh, on which you are sitting, because there are no gaps, no dust can enter, because they are uh, closely placed, closely, closely constructed, hence it doesn't allow any dust to enter these flow boats. So do with the training. If you train, make it a habit and train it, train your mind, then it will not allow any impurities to arise in your stream of consciousness. Only there will be kusala, wholesome things, skillful things to arise. And in the, in, in the arena of this practice, you note every arising, every seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, rising, falling, lifting, moving and placing. Train yourself. The more you train like this, the more you will become energized and with the fulfillment of energy you will be able to repel impurities, negative emotions. And if you are able to cultivate insights and knowledge which is maturity, then you will come to possess stamina. In this way, you train to purify your mind and uh, let the knowledge arise continuously. And train, let train, train your mind continuously in order to cultivate your mind and insight. In this way, you are cultivating this uh, <coughs> Samadhi Khanda, that is concentration group, which is composed of Virya Sari Samadhi, and they become energized, and as much as you are able to note concurrently, as a noting mind notes the object concurrently, you are bound to see the natural characteristics progressing along the stages of insight. And when your mind also will become energized, there will be some, uh, you will be able to possess mental powers, and as regards knowledge, penya, you will have, you will be able to come, you will, you will come into possession of bhavana bala, the power of meditation. So, especially, in, even in the beginning of the insight knowledge, vipassana you are not, you will be overcome by these unwholesome roots, such as greed about desirable objects, anger, dissatisfaction, disappointment about undesirable objects, not to speak of your not to speak of your status at the, at the stage of the fleeting momentary nature of experience when the objects are seen fading away. Every uh, rising object is noted to see the natural characteristics. Seeing the natural characteristics of every, every rising object, their conditionality and the universal characteristics, you are observing them in a very clear cut manner. There is clear awareness of, of the nature of these objects. Because of the clear awareness, there is no confused awareness. There is no delusion, no moha. In this way, you are free from these three unwholesome roots. Instead, you are allowing this lofty uh, kusala mind to arise in the stream of consciousness continuously. In, uh, to, to do that, you train continuously so that you will be, you, your mind will become more powerful, 
especially the the power of his controlling faculties such as the Sadabala, the power of faith, variable and so on, all these things will will arrive, will you become established in these powers, especially Hiribala and Odababala, the power of moral shame and moral fear, detesting and fearing, uh, loss of mindfulness and allowing Kilisas to enter stream of consciousness. So this, these are special, unusual, extraordinary powers that you will come to possess. They are very commendable. And uh, if you continue to practice meditation, you are bound to progress in a very unusual manner. In this way you train your mind. And training your mind can best be done in the practice of Satipatthana Bhavana. This Abhujita right the attention, constructive attention in a constructive way or having right attention in a constructive way, not wrong attention. Otherwise it's destructive. Uh, this can only happen with a sincere mind. Otherwise it will be a crooked mind. One has got to be straightforward, sincere and constructive. This is only suitable. The strong cause for that is firstly uh, having been able to live in a suitable place where you can find virtuous people. But it will be that is right location, good location, where you can find virtuous people, good people, good guidance. When you come to such a place, the right place, then you are bound to hear the Buddha's teachings, hear the sublime Dhamma, which will be given by the good guides, good companions, Kalyana Maida, such as good parents, good teachers, good friends, good companions. If you are able to depend, rely, depend on them, on these good individu- individuals, then you are bound to receive beneficial guidance in order to cultivate your physical, verbal, mental, mental behaviors in the right way. Hearing the sublime Dhamma, which can uplift your life. That is, Sadhama Savana, right? Listening to the sublime Dhamma. You are able to listen to the sublime Dhamma. Then, uh, you will be able to conduct yourself in the right way. So the root cause lies in uh, having been associated with Buddha Sasana, Buddha's dispensation in the previous lives. And uh, you have performed skillful deeds which is associated with knowledge. Because of the past deeds, you are sent to a suitable location and suitable to associate with good, virtuous people and be able to listen to the sublime Dhamma. In this way you are able to conduct yourself in the right way, with self-regulation, uh, leading to the right uh, constructive consideration or attention. We shall continue tomorrow. Sad. Sad.